good morning everyone um, i would like to start my presentation with a um, note of thank thank you very much dr chaturanga and uh, dr suneeshka for making me a ma making me a volunteer for today's presentation and uh, my topic is investigating a couple with subfertility actually speaking this presentation um, is made for medical students and some medical officers because when i was invited dr chaturanga said this is like for medical officers and medical students i never expected a single consultant to be here in the audience fine when a couple comes to us and then uh, we take a history and uh, examination part is done and then uh, then only we would embark on this uh, investigation part when do this couple come to us normally they do like they are, most of the public is aware and so they like uh, they try for about one year or more and then they just come and there are like some indications where the couple should come early and uh, those indications are like if uh, if the female partner is more than 35 years old and then they have to uh, they have to seek medical advice or fertility treatment after 6 months of regular and protected intercourse if they are unable to conceive and then if, if there is a history of oligomenorrhea or if the female partner is aware that she had um, she is having endometriosis or if this woman had undergone oophorectomy or ovarian cystectomy previously Uh, something like that if not if the male partner is aware of uh, a fertility issue then they have to come early should not wait a year or more than that after taking history and examination we arrive at a differential diagnosis and with that we investigate the couple whatsoever or the uh, like uh, we Uh, with it's like uh, something like this when it comes to male partner seminal fluid analysis is a must it's one of the initial investigation Ma male partner has to uh, make the sample or the produce a sample in, in a laboratory and then if he can um, transport it within 30 minutes he can collect it at uh, his home environment as well and once we get it and then uh, we analyze it and these are the who cut off point as you can see and these are the normal parameters if these parameters especially we uh, concentrate on sperm concentration and then uh, total sperm number total motility and uh, progressive motility as you can see concentration to be 15 million uh, per ml or more and total motility it's a combination of progressive motile sperms and non progressive it to be 40% or more if we take progressive motile sperms alone it has to be 32% or more if there's like a um, um, if we see abnormalities then we have to further investigate the male partner and this uh, sperm concentration of 15 is or more is the normal value and if it is less than that we call oligospermia as we, you all are aware of those terms and if it is less than 10 million per ml we call it severe oligospermia and there are like if if this sperm analysis shows mild deficiencies and we 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 normally ask the male partner to wait for 3 months because one cycle of uh, the production of sperm uh, to complete in one cycle of uh, spermatogenesis it takes about 74 days so we are asking them to stay home and come back in 3 uh, months and we uh, repeat the uh, repeat another sample and see if there's a gross abnormality like azoospermia or severe oligospermia and then we ask them to produce another sample and get the report immediately endocrine evaluations when now we going to get uh, hormonal um, samples like blood for hormones 
whenever there's like a, a concentration of sperms are less than 10 million or if the male partner complains of uh, impaired sexual um, function or if not um, say uh, if if he complains of like um, features of um, um, space occupying lesion like uh, like say early morning headache vomiting and things like that and then if we suspect this man is having like um, hypo um, you know, the, the pituitary tumors like um, uh, what we call prolactin secreting uh, tumor and then we get uh, prolactin levels if you concentrate on this slide and the uh, on the left side, there are clinical indications, the conditions, and then first one is like normal, one with normal spermatogenesis, and then you can see FSH level, LH level, testosterone level, and PRL is pro pro prolactin, and one is like hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and the second one is abnormal spermatogenesis, third one is complete testicular failure, and the fourth one is prolactin secreting pituitary tumors, and once we get, once we um, See a seminal fluid analysis with azospermia or severe oligospermia. Once we repeat the seminal fluid analysis, and if it confirms that this person is having severe oligospermia or azospermia, then only we order those um, hormonal tests. Once we get that said, and then uh, we we would see the patterns. We would see the patterns, and according to that, we know where is the problem and um, then on, then we would like a uh, counsel and then we would cater the couple and decide what sort of a treatment they need and uh, sometimes after seeing this say if it is like complete testicular failure and sometimes we refer this couple to a, a GU surgeon for a testicular biopsy something like that so when it comes to a man we get seminal fluid analysis depending on that we would get uh, hormone assays and depending on the result we would label this person or we would uh, we would come to know what sort of a um, uh, deficiency he is having and uh, then we would uh, refer them for further investigations thereafter and scrotal ultrasonography and we do not uh, order um, usually this is like if we cannot like uh, we normally refer this uh, person to a GU surgeon and after examining the patient if we find like some difficulties like say if we, um, if um, testicles are small or hidden at a higher level and those are the special indications for a scrotal uh, ultrasound otherwise we do not and ovarian reserve testing before ovarian reserve and the, if a woman says she has got regular menstrual cycle, that itself is an indication that she is ovulating. So we do not like get FSH levels and LH levels in that woman. In that case, we get day 21 progesterone levels. And day 21 progesterone level would tell us whether she has had a uh, develop follicle and whether it was released and now the, there's a good function focus luteum and all those would tell would be um, uh, that information would come to us if we get day 21 progesterone only problem with this test is if the cycle is regular we do ask for day 21 progesterone and it's expensive test when it comes to our setup it's not available in the hospital setup as well and if there's a woman with irregular cycles, it is advised to get start from day 21 and thereafter weekly until she menstruates. So this is going to be like um, weekly, uh, uh, taking uh, bloods weekly. And then it's not practical, but that's what uh, NICE or um, NICE guideline says. So the level is like uh, day 21 uh, progesterone of 30 nanomoles per liter or 10 uh, nanogram per ml is the normal level. And serum gonadotropins, when it comes to female, if she says that her cycles are regular, we do not check FSH and LH levels. 
and but when it comes to practice what this like the this is the, what i'm speaking uh, these are not like high five things but the things which we do day to day but sort of like irrationally and uh, we do see lot of couples walking with a um, set of investigations like say which were done like without a um, uh, basis or like uh, routinely and i think they're like semi fluid analysis is what we call it's the routine one say when a when a couple comes we do it routinely but other tests when it comes to female partner we should not just order if shlh testosterone or prolactin something like that depending on the history and examination we need to um tailor made what investigations do we going to offer that particular woman so um if the cycles are irregular only we would ask for fsh and lh levels normally we do ask uh, ask them to get day 3 fsh and lh because fsh level fsh and lh levels they uh, they are they, they, both those uh, both are changing according to the phase of the ovarian cycle and this one ovarian reserve testing and we have seen like there are enough women who are like less than 35 years and who are not going for in vitro fertilization but they are they are coming to they are coming to us for ovulation induction therapy or for uh, for iui like in utero um, intrauterine uh, insemination procedures but still like there are patients who got uh, anti mullerian hormone levels so it is not advised to get anti mullerian hormone levels until this couple is like going for an uh, ivf so there are three uh, tests which we can uh, do to um, check ovarian reserve in in the female partner one is the simple ultrasound scan of the pelvis we normally do it in like um, um, on um, day 2 day 3 like and so we we would see like all the follicles less than 10 mm if a follicle is more than 10 it's a growing follicle developing follicle and so we are like measuring this antral follicles are the primary and secondary follicles and then um, less than 10 mm ones we count and if it is less than 4 we call it a woman with poor ovarian reserve and if it is more than 16 it's a one with high high reserve there's a risk of um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and anti mullerian hormone is uh, the, another one and uh, in our country we measure it mostly in nanograms per ml if this amh level is 1.5 to 4 is normal and if it is less than 1 and uh, we do not advise them to get um, even we do not offer iuis but we do not ask the couple to get amh levels if they are not uh, going for ivf it's no point that it's like wasting money simple fsh is enough and then follicular stimulating hormone uh, level of 8.9 earlier we um, the cut off was 10 now it's uh, it is 8.9 it's low reserve and if it is 4 in international unit per liter and uh, we call it high reserve high reserve is like with our treatment there's a risk of that patient getting ovarian hyperstimulation and uh, prolactin uh, levels and tsh levels when do we order this normal like we like i have discussed earlier we there are like we have seen enough patients who are coming to us with tsh and prolactin those tests were just like uh, ordered just to see something it should not be and prolactin levels if the cycles are irregular and um, if she complains of galactoria or in the history once we dig into the history if the patient of the female partner says like she is having um, galactoria fine then we order prolactin or if she has like symptoms of um, space of fine lesion in the brain and then uh, or a known patient with pituitary tumor we do ask for and thyroid functions again should not be offered uh, routinely and in the history if we, uh, if we if we dig into the history and if there are symptoms of hypo or hyperthyroidism then we do ask and if not the chance of a subfertile woman having thyroid or the not um, clinically undetected uh, thyroid problem 
is um, the same as the ordinary population. And transvaginal ultrasound scan is one of the basic investigations. This gives a lot of information. And uh, we have uh, mostly we just concentrate on the uterus and the ovaries. And if we do a, like a thorough uh, 2D scan, we need not to have a 3D or 4D. Even a simple 2D scan would give us a handful of uh, details. So uh, we have to, um, like what we call like pan in the uterus. And we have to, from cervix to fundus, and then um, uh, from right to left or left to right. And we have to look. And then for what are we going to look? It's like a simple things like myomas, um, submucosal, uh, neural, and we have to measure each and every fibroid and the location of the fibroid. And um, if we have a 3D scanner, this endometrium, this is the like, um, can you see that uh, the central part is like a little bit of like a sandwich? It's the endometrium and with three lines, we call this triple layer. And then um, we do measure this. And if we have a 3D scan, if we see like some, um, they are like um, uh, defect or like um, cavity abnormality or something, if we have 3D scanner, then we can do a 3D scan and uh, identify the problem as well. And these are the ovaries. And when it comes to ovaries, we have to, we have like, uh, for some reason, we do not measure the volumes and all that. We need to, we need to measure each and every ovary and um, all in all three directions and get the volume. And it, it tells, um, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, if it is more than 12 ml and then uh, sometimes with aging and then um, we see like um, volume uh, is um, very low, like small ovaries is like, um, and with uh, few follicles. Uh, tells us that this woman is having low reserve and then uh, ovaries, uh, it's like age ovaries. And then uh, antral follicle count, as I said, the follicles, those tiny follicles, which are less than 10 millimeters, are like, uh, we can measure those antral follicles. And then um, not only that, with the transvaginal probe, we can just like push a bit. Um, we are the, we, looking at the ovary, we can push it and see it's a uh, relative movements um, and if it is moving then uh, we call it mobile sometimes we do see with that uh, what we call sliding sign it's like sliding of the ovary um, relative to the um, adjoining structures so if uh, if it moves then we are happy it's a mo mobile one and accessibility we do appreciate that if we are planning to do an IVF on this uh, woman. Accessibility is like, um, we are doing like, a, when it comes to in vitro fertilization, we pick up eggs through the vagina. And uh, accessibility is how easily, how, how the, the, uh, the, the feasibility of, um, or the ability to retrieve um, follicular fluid through the vagina. If it is attached at a higher level to the uterus, and we call it not accessible. Sometimes ovaries due to say endometriosis of uh, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, and we sometimes see these ovaries are adhered uh, up in the pelvis and not um, accessible through vagina. Not only that, so we uh, we have to uh, examine the uterus and then ovaries, and then the adenexe and the parametrium. Sometimes we do see like a um, um, yeah. fimbrial and uh, cysts and uh, things like that and uh, then the tubal uh, patency uh, tests and when a couple comes to us if we don't like um, we do these things like say ultrasound scan uh, vaginal examination ultrasound scan if those two um, are normal then um, we just treat them say if um, if we offer ovulation induction and we continue the, the same treatment for at least three cycles before getting a tubal patency test done, there's a risk of um, introducing like that. There, there's a risk of introducing vaginal um, pathogen to the uterus, and then it's like a it's a patent system. It's like um, 
if anything goes through vagina, then it would go to the peritoneum. So if there's a chlamydia-like infection, if we offer this test, uh, tubal test in, um, before starting any kind of treatment, and uh, in a in a uh, female partner with normal so called normal pelvis sometimes we may cause uh, pelvic inflammatory disease because of that well, female partner with a clear pelvis and we do treat couple of cycles before for intubal patency test and um, but if the patient is having some like a uh, pathology and uh, it's a different uh, case scenario, then we would uh, go ahead uh, with laparoscopic surgery and uh, dye test before doing anything. And uh, the, we could three test, but when it comes to Sri Lanka, hysterocyphingo contrasonography is not available. And uh, we do offer, when it comes to our patients, we do hysterocyphingography and laparoscopy and dye test. Laparoscopy and dye test is considered as the gold standard. But HST is, is still good enough. So um, women who are not known to have comorbidities such as pelvic inflammatory disease, previous ectopic pregnancy, so endometriosis, and uh, we can offer HSG uh, for screening the tubal occlusion because this is extremely reliable test for ruling out tubal occlusion. Uh, HST is less invasive, not involved in any kind of anesthesia. It's an outpatient procedure and um, it's cheap, very cheap can, uh, compared to laparoscopy. And whatever those procedures we do, we uh, cover that procedure with um, acetromycin. So that's a prophylactic treatment to uh, avoid uh, getting chlamydial infection. And HST has long been in use and widely available and it's, re it's relatively cheap. And it has a sensitivity of 53% and a specificity of 87%. And um, this is really like good enough to um, elicit the tubal patency. And there's a school like, um, if there's like a subtle uh, tubal occlusion and with our introduction of the dye and that block is released. So it is said like the, there are evidence like say, uh, there's a 10% chance of a couple um, getting conceived within next couple of cycles after HSG. And not only the tubes and uh, with the uh, X-ray film, we can um, look into the uterine cavity and if there's a defect, we would see as well. And these are some of the images of HSGs and it's radio opaque, the dye. And um, we can evaluate the uh, problems in the cavity as well by phone weight and you try and dye delphins and things like that. And uh, if you concentrate on the right side image and there's like a, you can see like there's like a um, growth there in the cavity. And limitations are there like false positive due to, but it's like this, like um, we, we are manipulating the cervix uh, during the procedure and then um, Sometimes we introduce a little bit of gas and those two causes tubal spasm and occlusion of the um, osteas. And then uh, dye, it's a, the female part is having patent tubes, but those spasms, um, it's like um, uh, occlude the, the entrance to the tube. So our HSD become negative. And um, so that is there, but it's still like then we can offer a laparoscopy. And then um, risk of introducing pelvic in, uh, infection is 1 to 3 percent. And high causing, it's uh, doing in a room with a scanner. We use a starch solution and we agitate it and introduce. It's a very good, like if you concentrate on sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity of 93 percent and specificity of 90 percent is so good but it's highly operator dependent the person to be trained well and then uh, one disadvantage is they're like set of uh, uh, female partners would be going uh, with inconclusive results that risk is there otherwise there's no radiation involving and it's like opd procedure and if we combine it with a 3d scanner and uh, what we call saline there's one uh, test called saline sonography 
and with this high cosy we can combine saline sonography first we do saline sonography if like with the help of a, like a catheter we introduce some saline to expand the uterus and then we can see the cavity any lesions there we can see and then then only we use the same catheter we introduce this agitated starch solution and we are tracing uh, using the ultrasound scanner and uh, tracing the path of the dye and until we see a spill at the tubal end so um, this is it and so we as we can combine it with saline sonogram and um, 3d uh, if we got the 3d facility at the same time and we can uh, appreciate the uterus as well so it's so good test and laparoscopy it's like uh, what we know like now it's widely available but only thing is like uh, we are not going to offer um, though we it's a goal is it's the goal standards but still um, we use uh, HSDs in our setup and we cannot get to all the patients and then uh, we do offer laparoscopy for the patients um, with these problems, identify these problems like um, with um, um, uh, peritoneal adhesions um, and then um, ovarian tumors and having endometriosis and then um, things like that. If she has like concurrent um, uh, disease in the pelvis and then we do offer because at the, they are we are not uh, only focusing on the tubal patency we are this is going to be therapeutic as well if the, if she has got endometriosis we would be able to remove the endometrioma and the adhesions we can do adhesiolysis if there's a significant myoma if we think that this is the reason and we can uh, remove the myoma as well and uh, it involves in um, risk of visceral or major vascular injury it's like 0.13 percent it's not that significant and uh, these are like if, if the patient is um, use a history of previous complicated appendicectomy or previous pelvic surgery um, if the, if we see that ovaries are attached and previous ectopic pregnancy or one with the if the female part needs having endometriosis so previous sexually transmitted uh, infection and then uh, those are the indications to offer laparoscopy in our setup and that's that's the end of uh, my presentation Thank you very much, Deepan. So, if you have any questions, I can answer. What are the oral induction agents you use? Uh, they are like, um, they are oral agents and then uh, injectable when it comes to um, um, oral agents, there are like a, two, two drugs, one is clomiphene citrate, other one is letrozole and they are like injectables like um, uh, recombinant FSH is available and then LH is available and then a combination of um, FSH and LH, uh, what we call HMG, human uh, menopausal gonadotropin, trophy and depending on, uh, it's like a, um, say, Women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and uh, the oral agent, drug of choice, oral drug of choice is letrozole. Um, otherwise, we give clomiphene citrate. And uh, if there's a couple uh, where female partners having hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, we have to stimulate them with uh, HMG, human menopausal gonadotropin. For IVF, say polycystic ovarian patient with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and whose ovaries are not responding to our oral age and letrozole, we do give a recombinant FSH. Uh, there's a concept that uh, you take both CPAs and uh, long time, uh, some, uh, uh, they can get supported. Do you have any? Oh, no, it's not like it's like a, what we call it, it's a myth. And uh, people do believe that um, long term uh, usage of uh, combined oral contraceptive would cause. Uh, sterility or infertility in male female partner no it's a myth because um, if uh, if we miss a single pill of uh, combined oral contraceptive there's a chance of um, 
female pa- the couple uh, fall in pregnant the female partner fall in pregnant so with that so it's obvious that there's no such risk and it protects otherwise uh, combined oral contraceptive pills protects the system and then uh, it would like real like a uh, uh, preserve uh, fertility than um, sort of like um, disturbing it So, uh, how long you investigate until that? Okay, you have uh, well. Um, so, IA, IVF. To go to an IVF, which level you are going to decide on? Yeah, it's like um. I I was thinking of like really discussing something like but uh, this is going to be a lengthy say indications for IVF uh, say um, hmm, they are like direct indications and we are not going to treat them with uh, ovulation induction or IUIs and directly there are like some couples we would directly instruct them to get an IVF like bilateral tubal occlusion or say due to ectopic pregnancies both tubes were removed and those are the direct indication and severe male factor so no other option and elder, elderly female partner with low AMH level we would ask them to go for donor donate egg IUI IVF and then um, uterine anomalies severe and then straight away for like surrogacy IVF and surrogacy and when it comes to our setup like see, they're like couples with like a, um, unknown factor infertility about say 20 percent of couples they do not have like any detectable um, anomaly like say having regular monthly cycles seminal fluid analysis is perfectly normal and uh, no tubal occlusion and for them and normally we do um, offer induction of ovulation six cycles and then uh, induction of ovulation plus intrauterine insemination another six cycles and uh, at the end of those 12 cycles if they do not if uh, conceive and then uh, they need to get an IVF and, uh, and they are like patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome and they do not uh, we, we, we would not be like really like resistant what we call resistant ovaries and would not be able to um, get mature follicles with the oral agent even with recombinant FSH sometimes it's not that easy then um, for those couples, we uh, we offer IVF, and if not like uh, endometriosis, severe endometriosis, IVF is the uh, mode of treatment. So, even though I don't know much about this subject, I'm asking a lot of questions. <laughs> but uh, uh, another question is, it's a very common problem. That is, uh, we believe in fertility centers. Like uh, there are a lot of fertility centers. You know, you go, we have a this, if you go to this place, you can get pregnant. So, uh, how do you check the center is good? I mean, like uh, IVF center, because they get that if you, you have to go to India. So, likewise, a lot of uh, you know people are talking about these are common issues. That's why I uh, ask, ask that question from you. Yeah, the problem is like whatever we do, it's um, uh, we are accountable for. I think as a clinicians, we, we have given that uh, Hippocrates oath and uh, saying that we are accountable when it and it's not enough. I think there should be regulatory body when it comes to fertility and its treatment, and um, there should be um, authority which is lacking in our country. So people, it's like when it comes to subfertile couples, they are desperate, and if they get conceived anyhow, they would not uh, question back how it would not happen so they are like um, legal uh, way of doing things and illegal ways of doing things legal way is what like what i have explained and so if we are going uh, for example if we are like ask them like say female with a poor reserve and then they need like a um, egg donor so egg donor commercially for that couple only and if not, there's another entity called egg sharing. It's like there's a poor couple, 
and there's a rich couple who can afford for an IVF, but that rich couple's reserve is low. That poor couple, that when it comes to female partner of the poor couple, she has a good reserve. So this uh, affordable per person can uh, sponsor for the IVF cycle and uh, retrieve it would be shared between those two couples. That's called egg sharing. So it's like either having a commercial um, egg donor for that couple or a name couple or egg sharing is the standard thing. But when it comes to, for example, our country, are you heard this is not because this is like what we are aware. I'm speaking of something aware, what the public speak. And then there's like a program in this country, like egg sharing. It's like they find like someone who is ready to donate egg and they retrieve eggs that say 10 eggs and simply would be divided between five couples, two, 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 two two eggs per each and those things are done because we do not have authority so if there's a man with severe um, uh, is say oligospermia or asospermia and then uh, sometimes without uh, counsel in the couple they would inseminate someone's sample these things are happen so if you are asking me about this uh, success rate and i think there are uh, we, as we do not have authority and no surveillance system and one center would be able to show 100% success rate using all that, like all that non-standard uh, or like um, what I, I have, I'm lacking the word. Uh, you, there are so many ways to show 100% of success. As we do not have authority, we will have to go by uh, the word of mouth recommendations are the only thing. When it comes to seminal free analysis, my way is like this is we are using 2010 WHO cutoff values. If we, see, we are going like say mortality, it's progressive and non progressive. If I see a report with A, B, 25%, A plus B of this, then I know if they do not know the current cutoff value, then how am I going to rely on the result? It's something like that very difficult in country if you ask me it's a very difficult question to be answered honestly and this is word of mouth 